Okay, here we go again with the Chemistry 3202 review. This time we're going to look at um, Hess's Law of Heat Summation, Unit 3, Section 3, Lesson 1. So here we go. Um, we're going to look at Hess's Law here. You can consult your textbook here, 677, 681. And there's a few textbook problems here you can try. And of course, the answers are in the back of your book. And if you still can't get them, then fire them off to your online tutor or fire them off in the discussion postings, and I can see what I can do for you. Um, what we're looking at here, of course, Hess's Law. I've got a picture of a nice little roller coaster that I, I, I rode several times in July 08 um, in Bush Gardens in Florida. And that roller coaster now is going to have a little bit of significant meaning, I guess, uh, as we start going through what Hess's Law is all about. So we'll come back to this little diagram now in a minute. But it looks like fun, doesn't it? OK, here's the outcomes for this lesson. OK, what we're looking at here is enthalpy. Now, remember we said enthalpy was internal energy of a system. All right, the total amount of energy in all the different forms. And we said that's very, very difficult for us to measure. But we said, if we can hold pressure and temperature and things constant, we can start eliminating all these different forms of energy and, and trying to do a calculation that would consider the change in enthalpy as being the energy that was absorbed or released by the system. So with that in mind, that we're going to be measuring the change in enthalpy, we can look at it from an energy perspective and say, hey, this is a state function. And what a state function means is it's simply saying that it doesn't matter how we get from point A to point B. What matters is that we started at energy level A and we ended at B. Suppose we took five ways or five different paths to get there, or we went directly to that path. It doesn't matter. At the end of the process, we started at A, we ended at B. Let me give you a little skiing analogy to show you what I mean. OK, so here's our little ski lift, crude as it may be. And here's our two, um, two skiers. All right? These guys are going to be our subjects. Now, these guys are on the top of a ski hill. So we're going to say that's where we're going to start. So they're at their highest energy point. Now, the very first person labeled H, OK, that would be Helen, say. Helen, or Heather, or someone like that, someone with a name H, Harry. Um, he's a little bit of a speed demon, and he's going to point his skis straight down the hill, and he's going to end up going right straight down and finish at point B. So this guy decided that he was going to release his energy in one great big swooping step. Boom, energy is released. Very fast, uncontrolled, out of control, very fast. This person E, I don't know, Elizabeth or someone like that, a little bit more cautious. They're going to start at the top of the hill, and they're going to start saying, I, I can't go down fast. That's too fast. Let's go down in a series of steps. So she's going to zig over here, and that's going to take her to energy level C. And then she's going to zag to this side, and that's going to take her to energy level D. And then she's going to zig one more time to go over to energy level E. And then she's going to zag all the way back to the start. So the fact of the matter is that this person went through a series of steps to get to the bottom of the hill. However, if we say, let's forget about how we got there, it doesn't matter how you get there. The fact of the matter is they're both in one piece. It's just that Elizabeth, or E, um, took a more roundabout way of getting down there, but she still got down there. So this is what we mean by a state function. It doesn't matter how you get where you're going. You can take as many steps as you want. The end result is you started at energy level A, you ended at B. The pathway you chose is doesn't matter. So enthalpy then, we say, is a state function, which means it's independent on the path taken. The path does not matter. Okay, so we're looking at this, and a fellow by the name of Hess, hence the Hesses, all those Hesses, 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 or Hesses, all, um, simply looked at this and said, well, we're not talking about skiers; we're talking about chemical reactions. And what he said is that, hey, 
I know what the chemical reaction is. If I can look at different pathways to get to that chemical reaction, then I should be able to figure out the change in enthalpy. So he's saying that if I can take two or more thermochemical equations and I can start adding them together to build up to that final result, that end product, then he's saying if I can add up their energy terms, then I should be able to get the energy that's equal to the amount of energy overall. Let's go back to our little diagram. Person H released their energy in one step. Person E released a little bit here. They released a little bit more there. They released a little bit more there. And then finally, they released the rest of it there. So what Hess is saying is if I could add this energy plus this energy plus this energy plus this energy, it's going to equal this energy. Rather than doing it in one step, Hess is adding up four individual smaller steps. All right, And that's the idea behind Hess's law. Let me give you an example of what he's talking about. Hess is saying, all right, here's two steps, two different chemical reactions. We know what the energy values are for each of these. All right, so he's saying, let's, let's use something we already know. What he's saying is we want to be able to figure out the amount of energy that's going to be absorbed when we want to combust graphite. Or sorry, for the, the, um, the incomplete combustion of graphite. So he's taking some carbon, and he's going to incompletely bust it to get, combust it to get carbon monoxide. So he's saying, well, what's the energy value for that? And he's looking at these two equations up above, and he's saying, hey, I can start manipulating these two equations such that I should be able to build that target equation or the equation we're looking for. So the very first thing he's saying is this is how Hess's law works. I go through the target equation one, one substance at a time, and I'm saying, OK, here's carbon in this target equation. Where does it show up in these equations up above here? Well, it shows up in this first equation. So what he says is, all right, this carbon is on the correct side of the arrow. They're both acting as a reactant. And the number of carbons, because that's going to matter too, because remember, enthalpy is an extensive uh, property. It, it depends on how much of the substance we're, we're reacting. So in that case, we've got one mole of carbon, and it's acting as a reactant. In this equation, we've got one mole of carbon. It's acting as a reactant. So I'm going to use equation 1 as it is. Now what I like to do up top here is I like to say, I'm simply going to multiply this by 1. I'm going to use everything in that equation as it is times 1. So what I do then is I rewrite the equation, and there we go. Now what I do then is I move on to the next substance in my target equation, and it's oxygen. Now oxygen is one of these substances that generally always takes care of itself. Once the reaction is finished and all the steps are completed, for some reason oxygen just takes care of itself. So I'm going to forget oxygen for now, and I'm going to move on to the next substance in my equation carbon monoxide. Now, I'm looking at carbon monoxide in my product, in my equation, and it's a product. So I look through the equations up here, and I, oh, there it is. The only problem is it's a reactant. So what I have to do is I have to flip this equation over so that it's going to be reflective of what it is in my target. In my target equation, it's acting as a product. So I need this guy as a product here as well. So what I have to do is I have to flip this equation. I'm going to flip it over. And whenever I flip it over, right now it's an exothermic reaction. I have to change the sign of my energy term because I reversed the reaction. So as it's written, it's exothermic. If I'm going to change this around, the energy term now is going to become endothermic because I reversed the process. So whenever I flip an equation, I have to change. If it's negative, I make it positive. If it's positive, I make it negative, All right, because I'm reversing the equation. Now rather than say flip here, what I'm going to do is I say I'm going to multiply it by a negative. Okay? And the other problem here is remember, it's an extensive property. It depends on how much carbon monoxide it is I want to make. Well, in this case, I only want to make one. So I only want to see 1 here. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to multiply this by a half. So the negative sign tells me that 
I'm going to uh, flip it over. And the half tells me I'm taking care of the number of moles of carbon monoxide. So I'm going to flip it over and multiply by a half. So when I rewrite my equation here, OK, I've flipped it over. So the carbon dioxide comes to this side. And because I multiplied this by a half, that's changing to 1. That's going to be a half. And that's changing to 1 as well. And don't forget, I also have to multiply my energy by a half. So as I went through by a half, this changes to 1. The carbon monoxide changes to 1. That's what I wanted, 1. And the oxygen changes to a half. The energy term, I had to do, I multiply by a half as well. And that works out to be a plus, because I changed the sign, 283 kilojoules. So what Hess is saying is I should be able to combine these two equations. And it should work out to be my target equation. Now before we do that, we have to look at this and say, now we've got to start crossing out so-called intermediates, kind of like. Remember we did that with reaction mechanisms, where we said, OK, carbon dioxide should cross out. And the reason it should cross out is there's no carbon dioxide in my target. Good, it should cross out. The other thing I want to look out for is the oxygen. In this case, there's a half of oxygen on this side, and there's one on the other side. So I'm going to cross that out, and that's going to become a half right there. All right? I got a half of one on this side, and I got a full one on this side. So I'm going to cross out the half, and it's going to end up being one half on the reactant side. Well, lo and behold, that's what I wanted. So what I would do then is I would rewrite my equation. There we go. And lo and behold, it ends up being my target equation. And what I would do then is I would simply add together my delta H's, keeping in mind that the signs, right? It's a negative 393.5 plus a plus 283. So when I add these together, it works out to be a negative 110.5. So just like the skiing example, instead of going one foul swoop, which we couldn't get, this is what we wanted, the one foul one step. In order to get the one step, we went through it in a two-step process. And when we added them together, we got our target equation. Let me give you another example. OK. In this case, we want to calculate the, the heat of formation of butane. So we want to form butane from its elements. So carbon and hydrogen is its elements. We want to figure out how much energy it takes to make this from, from, its, from its elements. Um, so what we need to do, of course, is Hess would have given you these three equations. Now, you don't have to worry about the equations that are given. Um, we, we would give you those. All right? And that's one of the, the problems, I guess, with this Hess's law, is that you need to be able to know how to do the equations. And you need a little bit of chemistry background. You need lots of knowledge of what's going on here. So what we do is we give you these equations. And all we want you to do is to try and manipulate them to make the target equation. So here we go. Once again, I'm going through my target equation from left to right, and I'm saying, OK, I need four carbons on the reactant side. I look through my equation. Oh, there it is. It's carbon right there. It's on the correct side. It's acting as a reactant, but I don't have enough of them. So what I have to do is I'm going to take this equation here, and I'm going to multiply it by 4. Get it? Because I need 4 carbons. And because I need 4 carbons, I have to multiply the entire equation by 4, even the energy. So what I would do is I would, uh, I would take step 2. I'm going to leave it as it is, because it's on the correct side. And I'm going to multiply by 4. So when I rewrite that one, there we go. So it works out to be 4 carbons, 4 oxygens, 4 carbon dioxide, and 4 times the energy. OK, the next thing I do is I'm looking for the hydrogen. All right. What would we do with hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is acting as a reactant, and I need 5 of them. Oh, there it is. Hydrogen is on a reactant side, but I need 5 of them. So I'm going to multiply this equation by 5, including the energy. So step 3, 
Well, reaction 3, I'm going to leave it as it is. It's on the correct side, but I need 5 of them. So when I multiply through, um, this is where it gets a little tricky with the halves and stuff here. It's going to be 5 hydrogen, 5 over 2 oxygen, and 5 water vapor, and times 5 energy. So when I rewrite this, I'm getting 5 hydrogen. Now 5 over 2 is 2 and a half, right? 5 over 2, because I'm multiplying this by 5. So 5 over 2 is the same as saying 2 and a half. And I get my 5 water vapor. And of course, I multiply my energy by 5. There we go. All right, we continue to go through our target equation. And I'm saying I need butane as a product. And I've already used steps 2 and 4. So there's butane, but it's acting as a reactant. And I only need one of them. So this equation is good. I got the right number, but it's on the wrong side. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to multiply that by a negative 1. In other words, I want to reverse it. And when I reverse it, I change my sign to a positive, right? Because I'm multiplying by a negative here. Negative times a negative is a positive. And I don't forget that I have to flip it. That's what the negative sign would refer to. All right, so we're going to reverse. And don't forget to change your sign. So here we go. We simply flip it over. So it's going to be 4 carbon dioxide. 4 carbon dioxide plus 5 waters. And then the butane is on the product side. That's what I wanted. And then I get 6.5 oxygen because that's what's there. And don't forget to change your sign because we reversed it. All right, now we start combining it. So we start crossing out things that we can that are on opposite sides here. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying carbon dioxide crosses out. And it should, because carbon dioxide is not in my target. Carbon dioxide does not show up in the target. So OK, that's good. That's a good thing. All right, what else can we cross out? Well, we can look at, say, water vapor. There's five here on the product side. There's five on the reactant side. So they should cross out. Is that a good thing? Yeah, well, there's no water in our target, so that's a good thing. And what else can cross out? Well, we've got a lot happening here with oxygen, don't we? And you notice there's no oxygen in our target. So all of the oxygens should cross out. There's six and a half oxygen right here, and there's four and two and a half right there. That's six and a half. Perfect. That's what we want. So my final reaction, it works out, and it works out to be our target. That's what we that was the intent in the first place to get the target. And when we add the energy terms together, now believe it or not, people make mistakes here on their calculators. They have a job trying to add together negatives for some reason and a positive. You know, make sure you can do this. All right. So the answer I'm going to give you now, you guys should practice on your calculator to make sure that you get a negative 125.6 kilojoules. Okay. So this one's a little more complicated. One step reaction here, and we're doing it in three distinctly smaller steps, and therefore we're getting the overall reaction. Okay. Uh, now, we've seen something like this with mechanisms before, didn't we? Remember we talked about the rate determining step and all that, where we had, you know, if we had a mechanism with three bumps, then we would have an, activate, uh, uh, an energy diagram with three bumps showing each individual step. Same kind of concept. Same kind of concept here, isn't it? Because what we're doing is we're going through a series of three distinct steps to get a final reaction. So very similar to what we did with, with mechanisms back in the unit of, of kinetics and reaction rates, right? OK, here's another one. Um, in this case, we're just going to do another one. Uh, we want to calculate the molar enthalpy of formation for glucose. We don't know what it is, but we're going to give you these three steps. So same thing here. We simply look at this guy and say, let's go through our target equation. Six carbons. There's carbon. So what i got to do here now is I have to multiply this equation by six. Don't forget to multiply the energy as well. OK, so we'll rewrite that one. So 6 times carbon, 6 times oxygen, 6 times carbon dioxide, 6 times the energy. You know, some people make mistakes here where they, they multiply the carbon by 6, but then they forget everything else. 
Okay, so you're multiplying everything by six here. Don't forget to multiply your energy. Uh, the next thing we do is we look at the hydrogen and we say, all right, there it is. It's a reactant. We need six of them. So lo and behold, I got to multiply this reaction by six as well. Okay, it's on the correct side, but I just need six of them. So again, be careful with the fractions. This is going to be six over two, which is going to work out to be three oxygen, six waters. Okay, there we go. And again, don't forget to multiply your energy by six as well. Now, with water, you got to really be careful with water, and you got to watch out the fact that in this case it's liquid, but water could also have another state. It could be gaseous. So sometimes they'll include an equation for water as water liquid going to water gas. So you may need to use that. So very important that you write down your subscripts here. Some people sometimes forget to write their subscripts and say, yeah, it's not important. But in this case, it could be very important because liquid water is of lower energy than gaseous water. So we would have to take that into account. In this case, it's not a problem. There's no water in our target. But keep it in mind that the state of matter could play a role here, too. All right. We move on to oxygen. And remember what we said about oxygen. Oxygen generally takes care of itself. So I'm going to skip oxygen. And the problem with oxygen, I guess, is that you know which equation do you use for oxygen? It's in all three equations. So which one do you isolate and say, OK, I'm going to use this one to get rid of my oxygen? So it's going to be very difficult. And for that reason, we're going to leave oxygen and, and hope that it's going to take care of itself. It generally does. So I'm going to skip oxygen, and now I'm going to go to my glucose solid. And I'm looking for glucose on, say, oh, it's a product in my target. It's a reactant in my steps. So what I have to do is I'm going to have to reverse this. So I'm going to multiply it by a negative 1. And of course, that changes the sign there. So the equation is reversed. So carbon dioxide plus water. There we go. All right. So the carbon dioxide and water come to the other side. And the glucose and the oxygen go to the other side. Don't forget, I change my sign. I keep the energy as it is because I multiplied by a 1. All right. This should work out, keeping in mind that oxygen, we should be able to get that to work out. Um, OK, carbon dioxide doesn't exist in my target, so these guys should cross out. They're on opposite sides. Perfect. OK, water is not in my target. I've got six liquid water on this side, and I've got six liquid water on that side. Perfect. OK, now let's look at the oxygen. I've got six oxygens on this side, but I've got nine on the other side. So these six are going to cross out here, and I'm going to be left with three. Perfect. That's what I need in my target. See, oxygen takes care of itself. So I'm going to rewrite this just to prove that my target equation is what I said it was going to be. And then, of course, I add up my enthalpies. Be very careful with the negatives on your calculator. Again, give it a try. Pause the screen right now and see if you can calculate the energy that's going to appear like magic. One, two, three. Here we go. Negative 1273.1. OK. So these questions, generally, you see one showing up on the public exam. Um, sometimes what they'll do here is they'll give you this value. All right, they'll give you the delta H of formation. And what they'll do is they'll say, OK, um, calculate that value right there. So what you would do is you would do exactly the same thing, and you'd put an x in there, and you'd try to solve for this. All right, so in this case, you know, you're simply you're adding unknowns together to solve for that. You're, you're adding these known values to get one unknown. So you should be able to find x in that case. So they could twist this question around on you and say, well, here's, here's the energy for the target. I want you to find one of these steps. All right? So you would do exactly the same thing. So you would do it in a little bit of a reverse there. OK. One more question here. In this particular example, they're asking us to find the enthalpy of formation for liquid carbon disulfide. So they didn't give us the equation we're looking for. They want us to find it. So we're saying we want to make carbon disulfide from graphite and sulfur. So what we're saying is, all right, carbon disulfide is going to be CS2. 
So we, re, we write our, our target equation saying it's CS2, making sure that we balance it correctly because, of course, it depends on how much of each substance there is, right? So it has to be properly balanced. And then we just go through this as normal, all right? So we're looking for carbon first. It's in the first equation. It's on the proper side. So I'm going to multiply the first equation by 1. I'm going to use it as it is, so times 1. I rewrite it. There we go. Then I would go through and I look for sulfur. Okay, that's on the correct side, but I don't have enough of them. I need to multiply that by 2. Don't forget to multiply your energy and multiply every single atom or molecule in that equation by 2. There we go. Then I look for my carbon disulfide, and it's a product. But in the first equation, it's acting as a reactant. I need this flipped. I need it on the other side. So I'm simply going to multiply that by a negative 1, making sure I change my sign to a positive. I rewrite it, simplify, and solve. And again, carbon dioxide should cross out. Um, the oxygens. 3 there and 3 there, they cross out. And I should be in business here. Oh, sulfur dioxides cross out as well, right there and there. So I'm in business. And again, check your calculator. If you never got the last one right, you better get this one right. Negative 393 plus a negative 593 plus a positive 1075. Ready? Pause it if you want to try it. 3, 2, 1 plus 88.1. There we go. OK, last problem. And this guy's a little bit of a tricky one here. And I think I might have already have it worked out for you. OK, I'll just leave it there anyways. All right, here's my target equation. I want to figure out the, the energy it takes to um, form into O5 uh, from its elements. So there's my target equation. So I'm looking at this, and we're saying, um, Again, we're going to look for um, the nitrogen and then the oxygen and the N2O5. And again, forget the oxygen in this equation, because generally we're going to get it to take care of itself. So the very first thing I want to look for is the nitrogen. OK, that's not going to work, is it? The nitrogen. And I need two of them. So I look down through here. Now, I need two nitrogen here. So what I need to do is I need to multiply this by 4. Right? Because I need 2 nitrogen. If I just multiply this equation by 2, then 2 over 2 is going to give me only 1 nitrogen. So I need to multiply this by 4. So watch the fractions here. So 4 times this one is going to be 4 over 2. So that gives me 2 nitrogen. 4 times this one, 4 times 3 is 12 over 2, which is going to give me 6. And then 4 times a half is going to be 2, and 4 times HNO3. So when I rewrite this, I get 2, 6, 2, 4. And don't forget to multiply your energy by 4. Now again, I'm going to skip the oxygen, because they generally take care of themselves. And then last but not least, we're saying, OK, N2O5, I need two of them. So I've got this as a product. I need it as a reactant. Sorry, I need it as a product. I have it as a reactant. So I need to reverse this, but I need two of them. So I have to multiply this equation by negative 2 to reverse it. So don't forget to change your sign here. And I'm going to 2, 2, and 4. So here we go. We rewrite it. And now I'm looking at this and I'm saying, hey, what's going on here? I had hydrogen showing up here. And there's nothing on this side to cross the hydrogen out, because hydrogen is not in my target equation. Hmm. I got to get rid of hydrogen. How am I going to do it? Well, this is where Hess's law comes in, and a little bit of knowledge about different chemical reactions. Hess would look at this and say, "All right, if I want hydrogen to cross out, I'm going to have to bring in something that's going to be able to take care of the hydrogen. Also, I got water on this side. I need to get rid of that too, because that's not in my target. So I want to try and bring in some kind of equation so that hydrogen crosses out and the water crosses out." And well, lo and behold, what they do is they look at equation 1 and say, hey, that's a good reaction. I need hydrogen to cross out, so I need to show hydrogen as a product on this side to get it to cross out. 
And I need water as a reactant on this side to get it to cross out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use equation 1 and simply reverse it. So I'm going to use equation 1, flip it over, reverse it. Don't forget to change your sign. So here we go. We rewrite that one. And we're looking at this and we're saying, OK, and this should work out now. I should be able to cross out my hydrogen. It's on a product here. Here it's as a reactant. Perfect. The waters, here it's as a product. Here it's as a reactant. Perfect. OK. What about the oxygens? I need five oxygens. Remember, oxygens are supposed to take care of themselves. I've got six on this side, but only one as a product. Perfect. That's what we wanted. Cross out that guy. And here I'm left with five. Rewrite it. And we got it. Oh, one more can cross out, too. Forgot that one. The uh, HNO3s can cross out, too, now. There we go. And we're left with our final target equation. And again, the oxygens took care of itself. And this is a similar type question whereby, you know, if you had, say, water vapor or water liquid, then you may have to bring in the equation for H2O liquid going to H2O gas. And you would, they would have that given to you. You might say, well, what do they give me that equation for? Well, little bells should be going off and saying, you know, maybe it's the state of matter that I've got to try and cancel out. So the same thing is true here. You might have said, well, why did they give me equation 1? Well, it makes sense now why equation 1 was given to me, because I was trying to take care of the hydrogen. Now, once again, a place where people go wrong here is simply adding these numbers together, believe it or not. All right, so give it a try. Pause the screen. And when you come back, I'll have the answer. Ready? 3, 2, 1. A positive 30 for my energy. Um, and you might look at this and say, well, how many significant digits? Well, we're adding things up, aren't we? We're doing addition. So when we add, we go to the least number of, significant, uh, least number of decimal places. And in this case, none of these guys have a decimal place. So my final answer is not going to have a decimal place. There we go. OK. Um, try some of these in your textbook. OK. And again, fire some of these off at your online tutor. And I'm sure they'll be able to help you out with some of these. And don't forget, the answers are in the back of your book as well. And now you know the significance of the, of the roller coaster, right? It's a state function. We're going to go from point A to point B. We could have actually jumped off here down into a pool of water and got all our energy all at one time. Or we could go through a series of very exciting turns and twists, all of which end up being a lower energy value until we end up at the bottom again, right? So we're releasing our energy in a controlled fashion. You might say not. Anyways, talk to you later. Bye-bye.